The Storyteller by Saki, 1888. It was a hot afternoon and the railway carriage was correspondingly sultry and the next stop was a temple comb, nearly an hour ahead. The occupants of the carriage were a small girl and a smaller girl and a small boy and an aunt belonging to the children that occupied one corner seat and the further corner seat on the opposite side was occupied by a bachelor who was a stranger to their party. But the small girls and the small boy emphatically occupied the compartment. Both the aunt and the children were, in, were conversational in a limited, persistent way, reminding one of the intentions of a housefly that refused to be discouraged. Most of the aunt's remarks seemed to begin with, don't, and nearly all of the children's remarks began with, why? The bachelor said nothing out loud. Don't, Sorrel, don't, exclaimed the aunt as a small boy began smacking the cushions of the seat, producing a cloud of dust at each blow. Come and look out the window, she not, she added. The child moved reluctantly to the window. Why are those sheep being driven out of that field, he asked. I expect they're being driven to another field where there's more grass, the aunt said weakly. But there's lots of grass in that field, protested the boy. There's nothing else but grass there, aunt. There's lots of grass in that field. Perhaps the grass in the other field is better, suggested the aunt flatulously. Why is it better, came the swift inevitable question. Oh, look at those cows, exclaimed the aunt. Nearly every field along the line had contained cows or bullocks, but she spoke as though she were drawing attention to a rarity. Why is the grass in the other field better, persisted Sorrel. The frown on the bachelor's face was deepening to a scowl. He was, hard, he was a hard, unsympath unsympathetic man, the aunt decided in her mind. She was utterly unable to come to any satisfactory decision about the grass in the other field. The smaller girl created a diversion by beginning to recite, on the road to Mandalay, she only knew the first line, but she put her limited knowledge to the fullest possible use. She repeated the line over and over again in a dreamy but resolute and auto very audible voice. It seemed to the bachelor as though someone had had a bet with her and she could not repeat the line aloud 2,000 times without stopping. Whoever it was who had made the wager was likely to lose his bet. Come over here and listen to a story, said the aunt when the bachelor had looked twice at her once at the communication cord. The children moved listlessly towards the aunt, aunt's end of the carriage. Evidently, her reputation as a storyteller did not rank high in their estimation. In a low, confidential voice interrupted at frequent intervals by loud, petulant questionings from her listeners, she began an unenterprising and deplorably uninteresting story about a little girl who was good and made friends with everyone in the account on the account of her goodness and was finally saved from a mad bull by a number of rescuers who admired her moral character. Wouldn't they have saved her if she hadn't been good? Demanded the bigger of the smaller small girls. It was exactly the question the bachelor had wanted to ask. Well, yes, admitted the aunt lamely, but I don't think they would have run quite so fast to help her if they hadn't liked her so much. It's the stupidest story I ever heard, said the bigger of the small girls with immense conviction. I didn't listen after the first bit. It was so stupid, said Sorrel. The smaller girl made no actual comment on the story, but she had long ago recommenced, recommenced murmured repetition of her favorite line. You don't seem to be a success at a storyteller, said the bachelor suddenly from his corner. The aunt bristled in instant defense at his unexpected attack. It's a very difficult thing to tell stories that children could both understand and appreciate, she said stiffly. I don't agree with you, said the bachelor. Perhaps you would like to tell them a story, was the aunt's retort. Tell us a story, demanded the bigger of the small girls. Once upon a time, began the bachelor, there was a little girl called Bertha who was extraordinarily good. The children momentarily aroused entrance began once to flicker. All stories seemed dreadfully alike, no matter who told them. She did all that she was told. She was always truthful. She kept her clothes clean, ate milk puddings as if they were jam tarts, learned her lessons perfectly, and was polite in her manners. Was she pretty? asked the bigger of the small girls. Not as pretty as any of you, said the bachelor, but she was horribly good. 
There was a wave of reaction in favor of the story. The word horrible in connection with goodness was a novelty that commended itself. It seemed to introduce a ring of truth that was absent from the aunt's tales of infant, infant life. She was so good, continued the bachelor, that she won several medals for goodness, which she always wore pinned onto her dress. There was a medal for obedience, another medal for punctuality, and a third for good behavior. There were large metal, metal medals and they clicked clinked together, they were clicked against one another as she walked. No other child in town where she lived had as many as three medals, so everybody knew she must have been an extra good child. Horribly good, quoted Sorrel. Everybody talked about her goodness, and the prince of the country got to hear about it, and he said that as she was so very good, she might be allowed once a week to walk in his park, which was just outside the town. It was a beautiful park, and no children were ever allowed in it, so it was a great honor for Bertha to be allowed to go there. Were there any sheep in the park, demanded Sorrel. No, said the bachelor, there were no sheep. Why weren't there any sheep? Came the inevitable question arising out of that answer. The aunt permitted herself a smile, which might as well, which might almost have been described as a grin. There were no sheep in the park, said the bachelor, because the prince's mother had once had a dream that her son would either be killed by a sheep or else by a clock falling on him. For that reason, the prince never kept a sheep in his park or a clock in his palace. The aunt suppressed a gasp of admiration. Was the prince killed by a sheep or by a clock? Asked Sorrel. He's still alive, so we can't tell whether the dream will come true, said the bachelor unconcernedly. Anyway, there were no sheep in the park, but there were lots of little pigs running all over the place. What color were they? Black with white faces, white with black spots, black all over, gray with white patches, and some were white all over. The storyteller paused to let a full idea of the park's treasures sink into the children's imaginations. Then he resumed. Bertha was rather sorry to find that there were no flowers in the park. She had promised her aunts with tears in her eyes that she would not pick any of the kind princess flowers, and she had meant to keep her promise. So, of course, it made her feel silly to find that there were no flowers to pick. Why weren't there any flowers? because the pigs had eaten them all, said the bachelor promptly. The gardeners had told the prince that you couldn't have pigs and flowers, so he decided to have pigs and no flowers. There was a murmur of approval at the excellence of the prince's decision. So many people would have decided the other way. There were lots of other delightful things in the park. There were ponds with gold and blue and green fish in them, the trees with beautiful parrots that said clever things at a moment's notice, and hummingbirds that hummed all the popular tunes of the day. Bertha walked up and down and enjoyed herself immensely and thought to herself, if I were not so extraordinarily good, I should not have been allowed to come into this beautiful park and enjoy all there is to be seen in it and her three medals clinked against one another as she walked and helped to remind her of how very good she really was. Just then, an enormous wolf came prowling into the park to see if he could catch a fat little pig for its supper. What color was it? asked the children amid an immediate quickening of interest. Mud color, all over, with the black tongue and pale gray eyes that gleamed with unspeakable ferocity. The first thing that it saw in the park was Bertha, her pinafore was so spotlessly white and clean that it could be seen from a great distance. Bertha saw the wolf and saw that it was stealing towards her, and she began to wish that she had never been allowed to come into the park. She ran as hard as she could, and the wolf came after her with huge leaps and bounds. She managed to reach a shrubbery of myrtle bushes, and she hid herself in one of the thickest bushes. The wolf came sniffing among the branches, its black tongue lolling out of its mouth, and its pale gray eyes glaring with rage. Bertha was terribly frightened and thought to herself, if I hadn't been so extraordinarily good, I should have been safe in this town at this moment. However, the scent of myrtle was so strong that the wolf could not sniff out where Bertha was hiding, and the bushes were so thick that he might have hunted about in them for a long time without catching sight of her. So he thought he might as well go off and catch a little pig instead. Bertha was trembling very much at having the wolf prowling and sniffing so near her, and as she trembled, the medal for obedience clinked against the medals for good conduct and punctuality. 
The wolf was just moving away when he heard the sound of the metals clinking and stopped to listen. They clinked again and in a bush in a bush quite near him. He dashed into the bush, his pale gray eyes gleaming with ferocity and triumph, and dragged Bertha out and devoured her to the last morsel. All that was left of her were shoes, bits of clothing, and three medals for goodness. Were any little pigs killed? No, they all escaped. The story began badly, said the smaller of the small girls, but it had a beautiful ending. It's the most beautiful story that I ever heard, said the bigger of the small girls with immense decision. It's the only beautiful story I have ever heard, said Cyril. A dissentient opinion came from the ant. A most improper story to tell young children. You have undermined the effect of years of careful teaching. At any rate, said the bachelor, collecting his belongings preparatory to leaving the carriage. I kept them quiet for 10 minutes, which was more than you were able to do. <sighs> Unhappy woman, he observed to himself as he walked down the platform of Temple Combe Station. For the next six months or so, those children will assail her in public with demands of an improper story.